This is a question from AQA A-Level Chemistry. It is a required practical question and it's based on RPA7. So I'm going to recommend that you pause on each section, have a go at each part of this and then review once you've tried it for yourself. So here are parts A and B. These are parts C and D. Parts E, F and G. And finally, part H. Okay, so let's start to take a look through. We've got iodide ions oxidized to iodine by hydrogen peroxide in acidic conditions, and the equation has been provided. We've also been provided with the rate equation for this. Um, we have got H2O2 to the order A, I minus to the order B, and H plus to the order C. In an experiment to determine the order with respect to H+, a reaction mixture is made containing H+, with a concentration of 0.5 mol dm to the minus 3. A large excess of H2O2 and I- minus are used in this reaction, so the rate equation can be simplified to what we're seeing here. So what we're now looking for is we've used a, why does using a large excess of H2O2 and I minus mean the rate of reaction at a fixed temperature depends only on the concentration of H plus. Now in real terms, we know that they are not zero order. So we've got to look at the information that we have that maybe seems slightly unusual. And what we're seeing is the large excess of both of them. Now what that means is that we can assume they are effectively constant, that if I change those by the same amount as I change my H+, plus, it's going to have a negligible impact. So we say it's zero order because our changes on something that's already largely in excess would not have an impact. Samples of the reaction mixture are removed at timed intervals. They're titrated with an alkali to determine the concentration of H+. Plus. State and explain what must be done to each sample before it's titrated with alkali. So what we're going to do is stop the reaction. If I just take a sample, it's going to carry on in that test tube. We need to stop the reaction because we are finding out in that titration the volume for what's happening at that moment. We can do that by diluting. We can add lots of water, dilute it down. We can cool it. That will slow down the rate of reaction, slow it down enough that it stops. The one that I would be likely to go to would be adding a reagent to remove the H2O2 or I minus, because at that point, the reaction cannot continue. Okay, let's move on to part C. How does the graph show that the order with respect to H plus is zero? Well, on here, the gradient remains constant. We're looking at concentration of H plus against time. You've got to be really careful here that we're not looking at concentration against rate. If that were the case, it would be a single horizontal line, which would also mean zero order. But the gradient remains constant, even as the H plus is being used up. And you know, I hope, that when we do a rate of reaction graph, generally, it will start steepest at the beginning and then it will level off when we run out of reagents. That's because we're using up reagent. That means there are less frequent collisions, less frequent successful collisions, and eventually we run out of reagent and it stops. This stops when we run out of H+. However, it's not slowing down. Proof that it's a zero order. Let's take a look at part D. Use the graph in figure one to calculate the value of K1. Give the units of K1. So we're going to calculate the gradient. Um, I am using as much of the space as I can. So that's 0 0.5 up and 415 over, giving me a value of 0 0.0012. In terms of the units, the units for rates, which is what the gradient is showing us, are always mol dm to the minus 3, s to the minus 1. But we can substitute those units into the calculation to find out. And mol dm to the minus 3 over s is mol dm to the minus 3, s to the minus 1. And we've got our answer. 
Let's move on to parts E, F and G. We've got a second reaction mixture made at the same temperature. Initial concentrations of H plus and I minus are both 0.5 mol dm to the minus 3. There is this time a large excess of H2O2. In the reaction mixture, the rate depends only on the concentration of I minus. So we've got our graph, we're going to plot the rest of it. I'm going to put those figures in. And what you can see here is a very clear curve. We're not going to do a straight line here. We're going to follow the predominant pattern. I don't see any anomalies, so I'm going to put those figures in. So that's part F essentially done as well. For G, calculate the rate of reaction when H plus equals 0.35. Show you're working using a suitable construction on the graph in figure two. Whenever you're working out rate of reaction at a particular point, you are going to draw a tangent to that line at that point. So that's what I've done here at 0.35. And I've taken that data. I've used as much of the graph as possible uh, to minimize any um, calculation errors there. And you can see gradient change in Y over change in X is 0.47 over 1160, which takes me to 4.05 by 10 to the minus 4, mol dm to the minus 3, s to the minus 1. Finally, looking at part H, um, a 6 marker. Uh, following the general rules of 6 markers, there are three stages. They need to be virtually complete to get to level 3 and 5 or 6 marks. We've got A, B and C reacting to make D and E. Um, in aqueous solution, A, B, C and D are all colourless, but E is dark blue. A reagent X is available that reacts rapidly with E. It means that if a small amount of X is included in the initial reaction mixture, it will react with any E produced until all of the X has been used up. Explain with brief experimental details how you could use a series of experiments to determine the order of this reaction with respect to A. In each experiment, you should obtain a measure of the initial rate of reaction. So there's a lot to think about here, a lot of steps to consider. Now, breaking it down into the three stages, which is what I would always recommend you try to do on these six markers. Stage one is going to be your preparatory work, your initial steps. And there's normally three to five steps within each one that you have to get most of. We're going to measure out volumes of reagents. Now, you could specify a volume, but if you do make it a reasonable volume, what could you measure in a pipette or a measuring cylinder, etc.? You're then going to measure a known volume of X. So again, we, I've not specified what that is here, but you would be working in the CM cubed level. Um, and finally, you're going to put them in separate containers. Now, essentially, you've got one mark for saying, I'm getting my reagents ready to do the reaction. Say one mark, one stage. Stage two is the actual procedure that we're gonna follow through. To get this one, you would need to be talking about starting the clock as soon as you mix them. And then timing how long it takes for the appearance of the blue color. Now. There are different ways you can do that. One way might be linking it to something else that you've done in a previous required practical, but when the blue, and it does describe it as a dark blue color, when the blue is so dark you cannot see across below your conical flask, that would be a valid way of doing it. And C, we're gonna keep B and C concentrations constant, and we're gonna keep the volume of X constant. And it's important we recognize that because we are looking at the order of reaction only with respect to A. There's actually a fourth one here. We're also going to control the temperature. We could do that using a water bath. We're gonna maintain a steady temperature there and there's actually a party. E. We're then gonna carry on doing this experiment and we're going to do it again and again, but with different concentrations of A. Now for this stage to be virtually complete, you would need to have got four out of five of them. Stage three, how would we use the results? Well, we can calculate one over T. That will give us the measurement of rate. And then we can plot that against concentration of A. So we're not doing this, but we're describing that graph that you will have done in practice as part of your required practical.
and then we're going to use the graph shape to determine order. We can look at um, concentration against rate. If it's a horizontal line, it's zero order. If it's a diagonal line, it's first order. If it's a curved line, it's second order. So you wouldn't necessarily need to go into all of that detail here, but that's the sort of thing that you're meant to be thinking about. That takes us to the end of this quite long question. Thank you for listening and goodbye.